So do you have any, um, there will be some questions, and obviously Richard wants to ask them. Could, could you just comment very quickly on the recent um, Time magazine or the book by Dean Hamer where he talks about God in the Brain, the whole notion of that? I'm, I'm afraid I haven't read it. So okay. I All right. So we'll, we'll come back to that later then. Richard, do you want to? Just a simple factual question. Well, I, so, A simple factual question. Um, the temporal lobe epilepsy people showed a strong galvanic skin response with religious icons. Do you, you didn't say, I think, whether normal people do. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, when we look at normal people, you, well, I don't mean normal religious versus normal atheists, okay? There is that question. But when you look at uh, normal, just anybody, you find, in fact, a high response to violence and a high response to, especially high to sexual but not very much to religious icons. In fact, you can even look at religious people, and you don't get that much of an enhancement in religious response compared to temporal of epileptics. So Charles Harper, could you introduce yourself, please? Ch Charles Harper, John Templeton Foundation. Rama, I love your talks. I want to challenge you on something that you jumped over very early on. Uh, you made a claim that it seemed obvious to you that, it was, that you couldn't have a person who was scientific and also believed in God, that it was inconsistent. And Only I said, a personal, yeah, go on, go on. personal view of God. Oh, okay, I, I want to challenge you on that. What actually from science, not from a kind of culture of science or philosophy of science or from scientific, scientism, but what actually from scientific research results would you cite to support that view? Well, I mean, this goes back to the notion of agnosticism, and somebody raised the point about teacups. Um, I think that. If I were to say there is a you know a dragon with spotted you know pink dragon with green spots it floating out there billions of miles away, and you you say I'm agnostic about it, I don't know. I mean the notion of a personal God has that same status, I think. Now if you're talking about an impersonal abstract God, like in Hindu philosophy, where they talk about Brahman, which is synonymous with the mystery of existence, as as, as Bertrand Russell said, that the fact that something exists rather than nothing is itself the greatest mystery of all. From that point of view, I am agnostic. But from the point of view of somebody watching you, yeah, I mean, everything we know in science, Occam's razor, you know, why would you want to postulate such an instance that Laplace said, or, or, or indeed Newton said when he said the hypothesis is non fingo right? Why would you want to postulate something like, like a personal God when there's nothing that demands the, the existence of something like that. Mm. I, I would just still challenge you that what specific scientific result, not a philosophy based on an idea of science or a culture, but what specific result publishable in research literature, that is where there's data and measurements, what actual scientific result would you use to justify such a denial of compati potential compatibility? Because as you said, there are many scientists who live very distinguished, undistinguished, all sorts of scientists who live with a compatibility of these beliefs including the impersonal and the personal God. And it is not the case that most distinguished scientists find that there is a powerful necessity based on their scientific experience or commitments or career to make a choice. There are ideological pressures, which have to do with scientism, with culture and so forth, which well, I mean, do require that. But science itself, I, I would challenge you to find a true scientific result that is an actual measurement involving real data that would require such a decision to be made by a scientific person? Well, just to play devil's advocate here, I mean, you know, you could say the same argument about ghosts. You could say that there is a ghost right now here which no scientist can ever disprove. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't interfere with, with, with the events in the world, but I cannot, no scientific measurement of any kind can disprove the notion that there is a ghost sitting here, right? And I, I submit that that's equivalent to, to your remark. I mean, I agree with the spirit of what you're saying, but equally, no scientist can ever disprove that. And maybe there are others in the audience who can chime in, like Richard Dawkins. Let, uh, can we just, uh, just do Larry Smart first, um, and, and then Sam Harris, and then come back over there, if that's OK. So I, w I was fascinated with your. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, Larry Smar. I'm a professor at UC San Diego in computer science. Um, with this universal uh, human need to create a God emotion, a God sense. And um, we found that a lot of external drugs, for instance, when they're ingested, the reason that they get selected for those particular drugs is there are endoreceptors that provide some sort of change in the brain function. 
that is pleasurable or is, you know, something that people desire to do. So it seems from what you're just mentioning there that there may well be uh, a component of the brain which universally uh, people have found how to stimulate through trances, meditation, whirling, um, you know, a zillion different chants and rituals. Uh, what, what kind of research has been done on trying to understand if there is, in fact, a very human um, part of the brain that, that um, if stimulated, seems to be very meaningful or pleasurable to people? I mean, if you're talking about certain neural structures in the brain, whether they have evolved through natural selection or they're byproducts of some other process, they may be neurotransmitters which are specific to those systems. And in fact, my colleague, former colleague, Francis Crick, used to call them theotoxins. And that is going a little bit too far, but they may in fact be transmitters. But there's a colleague of mine, John Smithy, who works on this very topic. Is he here? Yeah, there's John. I mean, he's interested in the pharmacology of of transcendental states and, and religious beliefs, and maybe he would like to comment on this. John Smith is right. Here we go. Yes, um, the, I've been involved in work with uh, mescaline for many years, and I think many of you know that uh, you know, hallucinogenic drug which Holtz Huxley made very famous in his book, the, uh, the, the, the Doors of Perception. And the, there are no other drugs which also have powerful effects on this kind of psychology, cocaine, um, some anesthetics, and so on. But I'd like just to discuss how uh, mescaline works. And the, uh, these hallucinogenic drugs have a very specific action in two ways. Number one, they produce fantastic visual hallucinations. And these are described by the people that have them, who've been very uh, down to earth scientists, most of them have Alec Ellis and Weir Mitchell and um, McDonald Critchley, very well known neurologists, as being more beautiful than anything that they've ever seen in normal art. They're, they are experiences of art, extremely powerful in all respects of color and shape and so on, what makes art. And so the, also, some of these people have the kind of experience that Rama was describing, of a sort of union with God, these mystical experiences, and so on. And these all act on uh, the serotonin 2A receptors. There's a specific receptor in the brain which all of these act on. And all the, uh, some of them are derivatives of adrenaline, like mescaline, and some are derivatives of serotonin, like LSD, dimethyltryptamine, and so on. But they all act at one particular place, the 2A receptors of serotonin. Now, serotonin is the earliest transmitter in the brain. It's the first one that forms. It's extremely primitive, in, it's, uh, serotonin has a very important role in plants and so on, has extremely complicated role in the brain. And um, the cell bodies are all in one little place, in the raffi nucleus, and the axons go all over the brain. And the, so there are every, it's all, uh, but the highest proportion of receptors are in the cortex. It's a cortical thing. And, some of these, the 2A receptors are stimulatory and the 1A are inhibitory. So the, uh, what these people are having is a gross overstimulation in the cortex of their 2A receptors, which induces these powerful visual experiences, powerful religious experiences, but very interestingly, they don't have any music. They never hear great music. They see this wonderful art, these wonderful pictures, they never, see, never hear any music. So, but although the temporal lobe has just as many 2A receptors as the, front, as the occipital lobe, so that's um, a very interesting problem. Why, why is that so? The 1A receptors, the inhibitory ones, there's one study done using imaging techniques just recently published of people who were psych, uh, two, control, two people, one group of people who are not psychologically interested in religion the other ones who were. And they measured the activation of the uh, 1A receptors on, on binding using uh, methods of uh, um, imaging methods. And they showed that the people who were religiously inclined 
had a decreased binding, very significant decreased binding to the 1A receptors. So the 1A receptors were not working. And they're the ones that inhibit the uh, activated ones by the LSD. So the two lines of evidence, the 2A receptors are activated by drugs that produce religious experiences, and the people who have them normally have an underactive system which inhibits it. So the 2A receptors are, for some reason, very difficult to explain. Why should they produce in brains of people who can't themselves produce any great works of art? Nevertheless, anybody who takes these things will have these fantastic experiences, which Aldous Huxley describes so well in his book. And of course, the serotonin is not the only receptor. There are opiate receptors in the brain, which cause similar experiences. There are the uh, many other uh, ones as well, these, and particularly when we're talking about certainty. This certainty has come up many, many times in this meeting. What does cocaine do? Cocaine releases floods of dopamine in the brain. Dopamine is the transmitter which signals reinforcement, and the effect of cocaine is to produce complete certainty. The rush of cocaine produces clear mental, tremendously clear mental feeling, utter certainty. You've solved all the problems of the universe. And of course, there's one other one which is, solves the problems of the universe is laughing gas, nitrous oxide, to go back to the NSA we heard earlier. And I think it was Oliver Wendell Holmes who had a, a reaction of, of, of laughing gas. And when he woke up, he said, I've solved the problem of the universe. There's a smell of onions all around it. <laughs> and that's the kind of level that most of them are. Paul. So we, we talked earlier about uh, just a second round. We talked earlier about whether we could evolve a new language for describing all this stuff. Whether whether poetry. I mean, but but the question is whether people are willing to walk around saying, "I'm having a dopamine rush," or "I'm having an excess of oxytocin right now," or "I'm having an excess of 2A receptors." It somehow lacks the poetry. But of course, Pat, you would uh, you would disagree, right? Yeah, I disagree. Um, it's Pat Churchland. Rama, I wonder if you could say a little bit about the uh, transcranial stimulation studies of temporal lobe on normal subjects and the feelings that that produces. No. Um, I ha haven't, I'm afraid I haven't looked at the evidence very carefully. And I've known people who have been in this gizmo, and, and the results are ambiguous. Uh, as you know, there was a recent study from, I think it was from UCLA, showing that if you stimulate different parts of the parietal lobes, you get out-of-the-body experiences. Either the sense of uh, you being up there in the ceiling and watching your own body, like a disembodied soul, watching your own body, or sometimes, and I've seen these patients with the right parietal lobe disturbance, who feel that they're here, but they feel another presence of something which they can't describe. Um, and sometimes they interpret it as a supernatural thing behind them, watching them. So either they get disembodied, watch their own bodies, or they're here. And some, so all of these paradoxes arise because you construct your body image in your parietal lobe. You get all these interesting paradoxes. And it's easy to misinterpret that as some sort of religious experience or God is looking at me from the shoulder or I'm looking at my, my soul is up there in the ceiling looking at me and that sort of thing. And you can probably get that with transcranial magnetic stimulation, although the results have been extremely variable. And I think actually Richard was... And subject in this, maybe you could illuminate. R Richard, had, Richard had a question as well, I think, and then Harry, Cr Harry Croto. I was a subject in, in Michael Persinger's um, apparatus. I'm afraid I was a failure. It did absolutely nothing for me at all. Um, I'm <laughs> apparently not, um, to, to my great regret, I was, I was not um, susceptible to any kind of mystical oneness with the universe. 